Well, welcome everyone and welcome to our speaker, Ed Hatton, our main storyteller, our influencer <laughs> who inspires us. Um, and uh, our current topic really focuses on um, making the or uh, helping, assisting the entrepreneur to provide an all-round um, performance. And, and what I mean by that is, is that not necessarily the kinds of things that an entrepreneur should be doing himself, but things around leadership, which we discussed last week, and then also building the team around him that makes him an all-rounder. And one of the things that Ed shared with us was, you know, it's not about choosing the best or the cream of the crop. It's choosing what's right for the job for you, what kind of fills that gap in terms of moving the entrepreneur, the business, to uh, addressing things in a sort of all-rounded way and um, moving the business to success. Um, anyway, Ed, without further ado, let me just also remind the listeners that if you want to listen to the previous podcast, it's episode 21 entitled The Entrepreneur as an All-Rounder, you can go to um, Griffin Enterprise Development, that's the YouTube channel, and you can access it there. And while you're there, you might as well just subscribe and turn on the notifications. So, um, therefore, Ed, over to you. Thanks, Jacques. Um, yeah, last week we talked about uh, the start of employee, uh, employee retention, employee motivation, uh, because businesses in many cases are built on people. Um, there are many dimensions. You have to have customers, you have to have staff, you have to have suppliers, you have to have sales. So there are many, di uh, you have to have money. So there are many dimensions to a business. But staff is certainly one of the most important ones of that. Um, we've all seen businesses that have succeeded wildly because the staff are just unbelievably dedicated, motivated, and hardworking. They really would die for the business. And we've seen others where you know, very highly skilled staff um, the business is just going nowhere. And we've seen some of that recently in terms of some of the um, uh, state-owned enterprises where, yeah, there are a lot of very, very skilled people, a lot of very capable people in many of these environments, but the business is just going nowhere. So no one wants to do anything. No one's motivated. Nobody knows where they're going or whether their jobs are secure. And everybody just sort of cruises on. So staff, a very important thing. Last week, we talked about, uh, as Jacques said, as you said, Jacques, um, about choosing the right, choosing right. When you recruit, getting the right person, not necessarily the most skilled for the job. Um, and sometimes it's quite hard to turn away the real star, the brilliant person in the field, because they're not right to fit into your team. Uh, they may be too much of a loner. Um, they may be very difficult to get on with personally. And there may be all kinds of differences there, although they are the star in that particular field. So choosing right is certainly an element that you need to develop. And let me remind uh, listeners what we're talking about here. We're going to go through about... Um, eight categories of entrepreneurial excellence, going anywhere from developing and living the brand to uh, staff motivation to just pure managerial skills and a whole lot of other uh, qualities. And then each of those qualities, we're going to break down into six or eight subgroups, and we're inviting entrepreneurs in each of these sessions to score themselves on a sort of one to five scale for each group and each subgroup so that the entrepreneur can find out if and where their weaknesses are. They don't have any weaknesses. 
and they score five out of five of on everything that we're talking about here. Well, fantastic. Why are you here? Why aren't you out banking money? <laughs> but uh, most of us have quite a few weaknesses, and uh, it's nice to be able to find the ones that sometimes we don't really think about, and then you can do something about them and hopefully improve your performance and therefore the performance of your business. And we're going to publish a little schedule of all of these as we get a, a bit further into this exercise. So far, we've, we've dealt with managerial skills, we've dealt with leadership, and we're now dealing with um, staff. The second thing that we talked about last week was killing ceilings, stopping this iniquitous um, limitation on people in the job because of things like their race or their gender or, or their religion or whatever. Um, if there's nothing other than competence, which is – uh, if there's something other than competence and ability and desire, why stop them progressing? And sadly, even nowadays, uh, things like race and language and um, uh, gender and all sorts of beliefs do stop people from progressing. They stop them from progressing in government departments. They stop them from progressing in commercial entities. They even stop them from progressing in non-profit organizations. And that's a terrible tragedy. Just if, if you're doing that, you have to question yourself, why are you harming your business by not getting the right talent for the right job into the right position because of some archaic prejudice against a particular class of people. Not a great idea. If you have ceilings, give yourself a nil or a one star out of that because it's costing you. And then the next area, and we didn't touch on this last week, we just gave the heading, is discipline and, if necessary, termination. It is a big part of managing staff and a very unpleasant part of managing staff. But if you're not good at doing this, then you are going to get a lot of discontent among other staff who see people getting away with all kinds of things. Um, you are going to allow the one rotten apple perhaps to uh, infect the whole barrel of apples. So you need to be someone who is able to discipline and, if necessary, demote or terminate employees if there are grounds for it. And clearly, here you have to um, operate within the Labor Relations Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Acts. You cannot simply willy-nilly say you're fired as was the case in the old days. Um, nowadays, you need to go through the right processes to ensure that the employee has the maximum opportunity of re uh, redeeming themselves and becoming a competent and willing worker. And that's right because there's a giant unemployment pool out there and if we just had a free-for-all, everyone would be firing left, right and centre and just taking someone at half the pay, some desperate individual at half the pay. And that's not going to help us at all. When you sense that something is going wrong or you get a report or a grievance or something like that, how do you handle it? Um, the rule is that it should be transparent, it should be fair, it should be applicable evenly across the board and it should be within the rules. Is that how you play it? I think there are a very large number of employers who will call a disciplinary hearing 
chaired by a supposedly independent outsider. But with the carrot dangle to the outsider that there's lots more work here if you find in our favor and no more work here if you don't find in our favor. Now, that's not going to be done overtly and I'm not making any specific accusations against any company or person. But we know that that happens. We know that happens. Um, and so there are some very, very warped results from disciplinary hearings which are overturned at times by the Labour Courts or by the CCMA. But even those processes are lengthy, can be expensive, can take a long time to get a hearing. So it's not a, a, a simple route to say, I've got CCMA protection, therefore I can, uh, um, you know, I can take a, a bad decision uh, from a disciplinary hearing on review. Uh, it may take you a couple of months to get a hearing at CCMA, for instance. So this is not my field of expertise, but I firmly believe that any disciplinary hearing has to be open, it has to be done with compassion, and it has to be transparent and fair. What happens if your star is one of those misbehaving? If the person that you really depend on in your business, do you treat them the same way as the person that you really don't want there anymore? because they're a nuisance and they don't work hard and they keep making mistakes. Do you treat the two equally? Well, really, you should be. That's very, very tough to do. It has been said that a measure of um, managerial capability is how many people you have personally fired. How many people have you personally dis terminated from jobs that they were unable to do successfully or where they behaved in such a manner that it brought the organization into disrepute or financial loss. It's a tough thing to do. And the people who have disciplined or terminated employees will know the sleepless nights that you have as a result of that because no one likes to end somebody's career. Got to be done, and you've got to face up to it, and it's a very, very difficult subject to face up to. But you need to grade yourself on how good you are, or, or will be, if that ever arises. The next item that I've got on the list here is career pathing. How good are you at mapping out careers for your employees, even the lowest members of your staff? Why shouldn't, after all, a floor cleaner become a manager in your organization? Um, there's a wonderful um, example of this, and I, sadly I forget the lady's name, but... Um, the organization that makes most of the touch screens for cell phones and tablets uh, is led by a woman. And she started life as a floor cleaner. And she is now one of the wealthiest women in the world. So why shouldn't your floor cleaner become someone heavy in the organization? There's a petrol attendant just recently who um, converted himself into a medical doctor and is going for specialization. There is no limit to people's ability if given the opportunity and given the right training and the right upskilling and the right confidence boosting. Why not career path your employees? And so if I were an entrepreneur with staff, I would ask myself, do we actually have a career plan for everyone in the organization? And if so, does the employee agree with that career 
party. Because, of course, some employees will be very, very happy to do their current job and do it well and do it for the rest of their lives. They're happy at it. They enjoy doing it. It pays them an adequate amount of money. They have a good life. They don't want any extra stress. And uh, they'll happily do that job and be motivated to do that job until they retire. In which case, that's the career path. That's where they're going. Stay where they are. But others will be ambitious. Some will be ambitious simply because they want more money. They don't actually care. And there it's a delicate situation because you have to give the balance of more money means perhaps more risk and certainly more responsibility. And the employee has to be made aware, has to be advised in terms of those issues. So career pathing is a whole subject in its own right. It's, again, not my area of expertise. I'm not an HR person. But there should be the opportunity to grow throughout the organization. Why do we continually see organizations that pull outsiders into managerial positions when they have dozens or perhaps even tens of thousands of employees. Why isn't there someone inside that can fill those roles? Mm -hmm. I, I think, Ed, it's sometimes a question of effort. You know, the effort of having the conversation with an employee to try and also align. Uh, you mentioned when you do career pathing that uh, you don't do this uh, without regarding exactly what picture or vision the employee actually has for themselves and um, doing all of that. But, you know, that's just the first phase of, of that, the plan itself. Then it's the execution of that plan, mm -hmm. which takes effort and discipline to execute. Uh, what I think organizations would rather do is not go through that investment phase internally, but rather um, find uh, employees that have been developed in other organizations and just poach them. You know, it's easier, it's more efficient, and yes, you will pay for, for that, but the investment internally doesn't always happen because, you know, uh, the business is there to focus on making money and development of employees, uh, sometimes we just pay lip service to it. Oh, we've trained you, sometimes even grudgingly. But mm. to have a real thought around, I want to develop you into the career that you see uh, for yourself. Um, that is an important, and I'm really passionate about that. It's a really important conversation to have. Sadly though, uh, we find corporates, government do this, uh, medium-sized enterprises, the smaller businesses, um, are so busy on a transactional pace, basis, oper, uh, operational basis, that this is a grudge uh, activity. And yet it shouldn't be. How much more value could it be to have people pushing for to step into bigger jobs? Mm. How much more productive is the whole organization going to be when you have those people who are capable and able to push into jobs? And often, in my experience, they will create additional business so that those positions open up for them. Absolutely. Ed. They will work hard mm. and dedicated and, and allow those businesses to open up for them. Mm. You know... <laughs> <laughs> Just as a little minor example, the IBM PC, which was certainly one of the forerunners of the, the PC revolution and was the start point of Microsoft with Microsoft's operating system. So it was a reasonably significant chunk of business that started from a skunk works a little group with people who went off in a corner and started to develop, started to think about things that the giant IBM wouldn't even dream of. And they came up with that idea. <laughs> now, yeah, that's not a bad creation of jobs. 
uh, it created the whole of Microsoft. Wow. <laughs> it created a very large chunk of the PC industry. <laughs> yeah, not a bad return for a few people thinking uh, with great ambition, thinking wisely. So that's an extreme example of of career pathing, but uh, it isn't a bad one. Well, we should be inspired by it. For absolutely, sure. absolutely. Um, another reason why career pathing is not being followed is to say, yeah, but I trained the people and uh, then somebody else poaches them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely, yes. <laughs> Done in the breath after the breath, which says, Oh, I got a great guy from those people. <laughs> <laughs> a little, a, a small uh, uh, dab of hypocrisy, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it better to have internally loyal people, mm. people who know and understand your organization, the good and the bad? of your organization enthusiastically waiting in the wings to take mm -hmm. over when someone does poach someone. And so yeah. if someone poaches someone, so what? Your mm -hmm. brand is moving with them. You think that's going to hurt? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Mm. So that, That's a good point, Ed. Very good point, that one. Subtle, but very good point. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, Training is obviously a part of that. Uh, uh, training employees, and again, especially among the SMEs, the small mm. end of the SMEs, we just don't train enough. We don't really put people through the sort of training that keeps them abreast of this very fast-moving world. Just take your average office worker. We just assume that they're expert in Word and PowerPoint and uh, Outlook and... Uh, Excel and all that sort of thing. And I wonder if anyone's ever actually asked in their organization, have you ever been through formal training on this stuff? And most of it is sitting next to Nelly type training, which picked up all of Nelly's bad habits and then added a few of their own. Guilty as charged. <laughs> 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 sticks his hand up. <laughs> I and cannot I, lie. <laughs> and I have to say, I'm equally guilty. <laughs> but I am now starting to rethink that. Hmm. So training, even the in the basic stuff, driving. We've got drivers on the road all day long. Have have we ever given them a driving, a defensive driving course so that they for a reduced chance of an accident or a hijack. You know, these, these are things that we should just be doing as a routine. Yes, it's expensive, but in the end result, productivity is that. Uh, you know, we only have to uh, have one car smash during a delivery and all of the cost saving that we've done has just gone out the window. Lastly, I want to talk about motivation, and we need to talk more about motivation, so we'll come back to this one. But I want to touch on a model that was developed by uh, an organization called Wilson Learning um, quite a long time ago. And it, its model is of a circle with a smaller circle inside it. And the smaller circle inside it is about the brand or the vision. In other words, the model says that people should understand the purpose of this company, why it's here. What is it set out to do? And surprisingly, this is a missing thing from a lot of organizations. And we, we've, we've seen research on this where people have gone into organizations of all types, government departments, uh, commercial enterprises, large and small, non-profit organizations, charitable organizations, and ask the staff, what does this organization actually do? <laughs> There's a huge amount of people that don't actually know the right answer. They may have some vague idea, but they don't know the right answer. 
classic response to make money. Yeah, it's a typical response will be to make money mm. or um, for the bosses or, mm. <laughs> you know, something like that. Mm. So that was the central part. And then the, the outside circle is broken into four quadrants. And the four quadrants are um, what is the part that you or your section play in this big picture? What's the big picture for your point in the company? What are you in your department expected to do? And then the expectations on you individually. What are the clear expectations? What do we expect you to do? Not just in terms of KPIs, but in terms of personality, in terms of all of the other softer skills as well. Caring, ability to promote the brand, all, all of those kind of skills as well. And the third quadrant is about um, feedback. How are you doing? And this is often such a missing part of people's experience. How are we doing? Especially, again, in SMEs. We often don't get told ever how are we doing until we do something wrong. And then, of course, we get told very loudly about that. How are you doing? And the last one is rewards. What's in it for me? And again, not just monetary rewards. What sort of career? What um, options do I have? Um, how can I get promoted? Um, will you support me if something goes badly wrong? Where am I on the retrenchment ladder if we have to retrain? All of those kind of questions. So this, to me, is a model that's always spoken uh, very clearly to employee motivation for me. And I think we, we're just about out of time now. So I'd like to devote a little bit more time next week to this particular model of motivation. Because it's not only employees. We also need to motivate our customers and our suppliers and our stakeholders and our board of directors and everybody else. Oh, thank you, Ed. Um, we, we, we're going to kind of leave it <laughs> at that point it's it's our cliffhanger point and so next time next week we're going to discuss motivation and yes it's a it's a it's a it's a rich and a deep subject and really to um to hear from your perspective ed and to see how we can apply this so i look forward to it so thank you ed and thank you for taking us through uh the series really and i think i've finally gotten the title right <laughs> <laughs> we our series is on entrepreneurial excellence and this has been part three so uh, until next week we will then continue and we will then address part four and start with the motivation so thank you for listening thank you for those who have attended and once again thank you ed cheers Bye. for now thanks cheers